The Walking Dead Zombies. Generally, they are all weak, unintelligent, and incredibly slow beings. However, in large numbers, this is where they find their strength. Overrunning an area or surrounding the living. This is one of the reasons they are so incredibly dangerous. Despite their slow speed and lack of strength, in the Walking Dead universe, nearly the entire world's population has been wiped out. 6.9 billion, in fact, by 2010, were killed off or changed into the living dead. To put that into perspective, the zombie outbreak was so vast that at its peak, the zombies outnumbered humans 5,000 to 1. The zombies of this universe are an interesting one. They do not progress in a positive manner. They do not evolve. They merely function and deteriorate until eventually nothing is left but a skeleton. Meaning eventually, the populace would all but be destroyed. The pathogen itself is pretty much a mystery. In the Walking Dead universe, a pathogen was contracted that for whatever reason, and through entirely unknown means, brings the recently deceased back to life, reanimating the corpse. The origin of this pathogen is completely unknown. Whether it is natural or man-made is again a mystery. A scientist by the name of Dr. Edwin Jenner even speculated that the disease could be of a supernatural origin. Interestingly, the pathogen does not actually kill its host. It does, however, remain dormant, potentially in neural cells within the brain, which leaves the host to seem to be in perfect health, physically and visibly. However, when the host dies, this is when the pathogen becomes active, infecting the corpse and reviving the neural structure in the brainstem, as well as certain parts of the cerebellum. This then turns what was a human into the living dead. A zombie, if you will. The pathogen itself seems to have two separate and parallel means of infecting a host. Latent contraction and contact with fluids, bites or scratches. The latent form of contraction refers to the notion that nearly everyone, if not all humans on the entire planet, are now believed to be infected with the pathogen in its dormant stage. It is currently unknown how one contracts the dormant stage of the pathogen, though its apparent total infection rate worldwide suggests it is either airborne, waterborne, or both. Once infected, the virus spreads throughout the body, likely concentrating in the central nervous system. However, so long as the host remains alive, the pathogen remains latent, or dormant, within them, and is asymptomatic to the host. And then there is the contact form of contraction. Though physical contact with a zombie's saliva or blood will not cause an individual fatal infection, any fluid contact with open wounds will lead to irreversible contamination of the individual. However, zombie bites are not necessarily fatal because of the zombie pathogen. One possible explanation is that through bites, the active pathogen within the zombie induces a fatal and irreversible cytokine storm, further exacerbated by infection by bacteria that reside in a zombie's mouth. Scratches could cause similar infections for similar reasons. However, no one in the comic or TV show universes has ever gotten the fever as a result of a scratch. While zombie scratches and clawing cause fatal infections, the deep gouges generally left by zombie bites are almost always fatal. Death can potentially be avoided if the bite is on an appendage, which then obviously is amputated. However, this does not always work, and bites on the torso or on veins or arteries are universally fatal. Even if an amputation proves successful at removing the infection, blood loss and subsequent infection is also extremely dangerous due to the generally unprofessional execution of the procedure. Incidentally, these differ between the comic series and the TV series. In the comic series, getting zombie bodily fluid or any part of the body of the zombie directly into contact with your blood causes infection, fever and death as evidenced by Negan's successful tactic to cover weapons in zombie flesh and guts for one-hit kills. 
And then within the TV series universe, it is unclear whether or not the rule of infection from the comic series is applicable. One individual accidentally cuts another's arm with her zombie blood-soaked knife, and yet he survived, indicating that the rules in the television universe are different. This is referenced earlier in Season 2, where a character cuts his own hand with a knife that was previously used to kill a walker, and later wipes his cut on a place where a walker has licked. The pathogen itself has a two-stage form of infection, dormant and active, and in each stage it acts differently within its host. As mentioned previously, during the dormant stage, the pathogen is asymptomatic. The host will thus remain healthy despite being technically infected, and will continue to remain so as long as they are alive. As soon as the host dies, the dormant pathogen enters the active stage and will begin the process of reanimating the body through the infection and reactivation of the neural structures in the brain. No matter how an individual dies, unless their brain was severely damaged or destroyed, they will be reanimated into a zombie following their death. The pathogen enters this active stage when an individual dies and is responsible for the host's reanimation as a zombie. When an individual is bitten by a zombie, the active pathogen is transmitted into them as well as a plethora of bacteria and other infectious agents that reside in a zombie's mouth. In the event that amputation fails or is not possible, it is believed that the active pathogen then induces a fatal and irreversible cytokine storm, causing a high fever, aches, extreme fatigue and nausea. As the infection then progresses, the active pathogen invades and spreads through the brain like meningitis, infecting synapses and other neural structures that are concentrated in the brainstem and parts of the cerebellum. At the climax of the infection, the adrenal glands hemorrhage and the brain completely shuts down. All brain activity would cease, followed by the major organs, and the body would be clinically dead. No measurable brain activity, no reflexes, and no respiration or pulse. The time between the onset of symptoms and death, followed by the reanimation, is very much dependent on the severity of the wound. The dead corpse of anyone that dies, for any reason, will reanimate as a zombie. Unless the brain of the individual is badly damaged or destroyed, or the person was dead prior to the outbreak. And as seen on the MRI of Candice Jenner, when a person dies, the active pathogen they carry reactivates critical areas of the brain that it infected. Specifically, the brainstem and some parts of the cerebrum and cerebellum. This supports necessary vital systems such as movement, resulting in reanimation after a viable amount of time. Since the active pathogen only reactivates the brainstem and not parts of the brain, such as the frontal lobe and neocortex that are responsible for higher order brain functions, the reanimated person retains only a physical resemblance to their former self. In the TV series, it was stated that a corpse can reanimate between 3 minutes and 8 hours after death though the video game universe suggests it could happen in seconds. The physiology of the zombies differ between the comic and TV series. However, combined, we do know that the zombies have the ability to detect scents and can differentiate between the living and the dead. They prefer to feed, of course, on living flesh. Covering oneself in the scent of decay can act as a camouflage and fool the zombies. They can also use sight to distinguish the living from the dead, although they seem to have poor eyesight as their irises fade and decay over time. They make up for this, however, with heightened senses of hearing and smell. Darkness seems to have little effect on zombies' senses at close range, and in areas devoid of light, they can still find their way around, as they would in the day. The individual zombie's strength depends very much on the physical makeup of the individual and on how long they have been reanimated. When attacking, zombies often become more lively, exhibiting full body effort, and can produce enough force to quickly overwhelm an adult human. The zombies have been shown to be able to rip open humans and animal victims with ease, and they can even rip off human limbs with enough force. As zombies decay, However, their muscles and consequently their entire body become slowly but surely weaker. Zombies, of course, feel no pain as they are dead. 
Although slow and seemingly unintelligent when not active, they can react quickly to sufficient stimulation and can rapidly overpower a victim they have taken by surprise. Though their bodies are no more or less durable than a non-decomposed human body, they can absorb all manner of physical damage, even when badly decomposed. Anything other than a head attack, spinal cord severing or dismemberment leaves them seemingly unfazed. As long as their brain remains intact, everything that is attached to the brain can continue to function as normal, even if only the skull remains and is severed from the body. Other than a mostly intact brain, zombies don't appear to require any vital systems or organ functions to survive. Although their ambulatory functions do decrease as their level of decomposition increases. Sufficient physical damage can slow them down or render them incapacitated. And of course, compared to humans, zombies have rather limited mobility. Unstimulated, zombies stand still, or they shuffle around slowly. When in this state, they are sometimes referred to as lurkers, as they can quickly activate, attack and kill. Zombies can also be found lying on the ground or in piles of other bodies, and can appear to be dead until stimulated. If they are pursuing a possible victim, zombies can move somewhat more quickly, roughly equivalent to a very light jogging pace. They can also lunge very short distances to grab close prey. And, amazingly, they are difficult to shake off if they do manage to grab their victims, often allowing their arm to be ripped off before they will even begin to let go. As this universe and its zombies are eerily similar to that of the Day of the Dead, the method by which total disposal is achieved is by destroying the brain. So get your guns, bats and knives ready. If the zombie apocalypse ever happens, that is. I know I have a lot of subscribers that are fans of The Walking Dead, so please do take this as a gift to you all. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you're new to the channel, then consider checking out the other content I have on offer. As always though, please do let me know all your thoughts down below in the comment section, and if you did enjoy this, then please consider leaving it a like and subscribing to the channel for more in the future. If you want to interact with me, see what I'm up to in my daily life, then check out my social media, Twitter, Instagram, over at Mr. H Reviews. As always though, I've been Mr. H, and until next time, I will catch you in the comment section.